Hey, 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 filmmakers, welcome to uh, this uh, week's uh, Black Magic Collective Initiatives, uh, Black Magic Collectives uh, event, which is Know Your GE Crew. I think that GE Crew have supported us for so many years, and half of us don't even know what they do and who exactly is GE. So, we're going to dive in that today. Uh, before we get started, please let us know that you're here by putting in the comments box where you're from, what you do in the biz. We love to know where you're at and um, how we can best support your. Um, knowledge today your knowledge or your quest for knowledge and uh by all means the entire event please put your questions in the box and we will answer them all um within reason you know unless they're weird even the weird ones unless they're dirty i don't know put them in that box uh if you're new to this we are the black magic collective we are a collective of artists um, and crew who are in film and TV and basically uh, just come together as a community to learn, to inspire. And we have all kinds of initiatives that are all free for you. And our newest or current initiative that you could apply for today is the last day. It is the accountability of initiative. It's a one year program to help you be accountable for achieving your goals and to get that support. Go to tinyurl.com forward slash BMC accountability tinyurl.com forward slash BMC accountability and learn about that and get your applications in today. We would love to uh, thank our sponsor, Black Magic Design, who is always uh, has our back, uh, helping our fellows out and supporting all the filmmakers and everything we do, as well as Sigma, who has recently come on as a sponsor. And we're very excited to have them on board. We have some really great events coming up for you in April with them. So stay tuned for that. And um, I guess finally, if you are here at the end of the uh, the hour, we will have a uh, Da Vinci Resolve studio seat giveaway. So if you don't have Da Vinci Resolve, definitely stick around, get your info in the box so that we can uh, put you in that raffle. Hey, Kayla, welcome, LA-based actor, writer, producer, and Kate, uh, writer director of feminist dark comedies in LA. Oh, you're learning well. I like that, Kate. Uh, Jared, he's New York, North Carolina based filmmaker. That's awesome. We're actually about to start our first chapter in North Carolina, the Wilmington area, but we're also working on other areas. What area are you in Jared? Uh, Tim, welcome Vancouver actor, casting director, story editor, producer. You're very busy and, uh, probably a little bit, um, like the rest of us, a little loopy, trying to remember what you're doing day to day. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Everybody else continue to let us know you're here. We are going to jump in right now with a know your crew. So first off, I am making the Black Magic Collective chairman of the board join me today, uh, John Parento, because he's a filmmaker, but he's done, he's done every probably every position there ever is in film, and he's going to be a great asset to have and ask questions along the way. And he's also with Black Magic Design, so you know, be nice, suck up say nice things to him. Hey, welcome. Too much. Too much. I mean, just like Tim, I do too much. Way too much. Yes, yes. <laughs> he does, actually. Uh, then we have Jason Andrew. He's a key grip for shows like Amazon's Boss. He's worked on huge movies like the first Spider-Man. And he is now working um, sort of his career moving up into the director of photography uh, lane. So thank you, Jason, for being here. Thanks and Steve me. Mathis, he's a gaffer for currently a gaffer for Reservation Dogs. He was a, on one of my favorite movies ever, Moulin Rouge. He worked on that. I have so many questions. Um, and I'm very, um, very happy that you guys are here to join us and really talk about starting off is like, what exactly is the GE team? I want people who are here are probably really looking to know what does each position do? Um, how is it different from, you know, the camera department? Because the g &E team is a lot of different people with a lot of different jobs. Um, so I guess we could start with just like between Steve, Jason, and John, start breaking down sort of the basic g &E jobs to start us off. Let's start with Steve uh, Gaffer. So be, tell us first of all what a Gaffer specifically does and kind of what your crew is comprised of and what they're allowed to touch versus not allowed to touch, which is a whole union thing. Well, the whole union thing's a misnomer. People get that way, but it's not really true. My guys help Jason pick up sandbags, and his guys help me move a light and stuff like that. So it's that's not real. That, that's something that everybody likes to say, but I've never been on a movie set where it was literally true. Sometimes you don't want people to touch electricity and things if they don't know what they're doing. But it took me years to figure out what a gaffer was. And I bet Jason had the same problem with a key grip. You know, sure. ultimately, you know ultimately, we, I just, I came to the conclusion that what I'm supposed to do is help the DP figure out his vision and, and accomplish it. 
I don't know if Jason agree with that now that he's a DP, but uh, <laughs> it, that's that's how I that's how I work. I you know the DP and I talk about it, and sometimes the director cares, sometimes they don't, and we go from there. And who and works under you in terms exactly. of exactly? Yeah, uh, I have a best boy, or and and I usually I, about half the time it's a woman, but they reject the term best girl or anything else. They like the term best boy. Even in this day and age, uh, I usually on bigger shows have a dimmer board operator. They like to call themselves a console lighting programmer, but they're a dimmer board operator. That's what they are. Um, and I have lamp operators and condor operators. I mean, everybody has to know the basics of electricity, but also I like my crew to be smart and well read and uh, uh, interested in filmmaking. So many kids that I work with now don't go to movies. Yeah, it's so it's such a weird uh, time. Um, so then we move to let's move to the grip side just really quick to get that sort of overview. So Jason is key grip. What does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that as Steve was saying, you know, helping the DP get his you know vision. I, I mainly do the day stuff. So when we're doing uh, negative fill balances. The, we also incorporate the dolly, so then my, I'm in charge of the dolly grips, making sure that we're doing all the camera movement, cranes, and then uh, when we go into the lighting mode, then I become shaper. So Steve will say, put a light up and say, you know, it's just for this actor, take it off the wall here. Sometimes he doesn't tell me to take it off the wall, sometimes I just do it because it looks better. <laughs> but, you know, we, we work together and soften the light, and uh, it's all kind of comes together as a vision of what the show is looking for as far as style. So, you know, and then on the shows like I'm doing now where it's almost all green screen, that that's the grips all day are moving green screens around. Yeah. Hiding that's things and um, getting with the visual effects guys and telling, you know, working with them. So it's, it's, it's interesting. That's why I gravitated to that because I get to do camera lighting and then I also get to do, um, you know, all the other, you know, going in the helping effects cool. out, helping construction, you get to do a little bit of everything. Rigging, cool rigging stuff. Yeah. Cool rigging, overhead silks. Yeah. Anything so camera is, as far as grip team goes, do you have like how many grips are tip on a typical show like Bosch? On a show like Bosch, I have a, a best boy, just like the, the electric does. And he is responsible for crewing up time cards, ordering equipment you know, managing the crew. Then I have two dolly grips. Generally we have a two camera crew. So I have two dolly grips. And if we're going on location, I carry about six grips and that that's because that shows very heavy on moving. So we're constantly doing, you know, three setups, getting on a stake bed, traveling to the next location, building frames. You know, it's, it's three locations a day generally. So it's a lot of moving, at least just moving parts and organizing all that. So to break it down for everybody who's here who might be really new to set and um, you just know there's a lot of moving parts. So I'm going to really quick name off certain jobs and you guys tell me what's the title of the person doing that job. Okay. So obviously someone pushing the dolly you just said is a grip. Dolly, dolly grip. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Laying down the track. Dolly grip. Um, moving. Grips help though. I mean, it's like the dolly grip. Grips kind of full and help everybody it's kind of a um we do everything we help everyone um moving c-stands that's all well it depends electric stuff c stands we mainly grips setting c-stands and then so if you're but if you're putting a flag on a c-stand still a grip the grip thing yes moving the uh using the flag to sh like if you're actually moving the flag back and forth on the c stands that's still a grip all, all grips yeah okay so the grips are really hand really man i, I wouldn't say like, anybody who's manhandling the set is a grip was that accurate they, they do that yes <laughs> who who is laying down stingers extension cords for the rest of the world um my department so is there a specific person who does that like that uh yeah, whoever the person needs the stinger comes up to, including me. You know, they'll say we need us we need to plug in this. Usually, it's a cell phone or a monitor or the sound card or something like that. Uh, but yeah, we run all the stingers and all the power. 
Um, trying to think of other random things like that. Like, so who who is in charge? Because this might be a camera, it might be camera, it might be grip. I'm not even sure myself. Who is setting up Video Village? Who's putting the monitors up and getting that all together? The, the camera and the, I guess the second AC is in the video. To, yeah. Right? Okay. Video I generally ha- get, get the, will help shade the monitors, which yeah. becomes a grip thing for some reason. But I, I help out as much as I can. Yeah. We plug them in. Jason puts up the shade so the director doesn't yell at you because he can't see the monitor. <laughs> it's it's got to be plugged in and shaded before they're happy. It's crazy because we, it's like the G, the G&E team is responsible for almost like everything that is the set. You know, like the director's pointing, the DP is pointing, and you guys are doing the hard labor. And that's why I think that like a lot. I wanted to do this particular. Uh, event because I don't know that everybody really appreciates their GE team the way they should, especially as indie filmmakers uh, or even newer filmmakers when you are every crew person. So you don't really understand. Like I, I remember my first big set, I'm a director, but my first big set where I had a whole team, I went to go move some chapstick because it was just like right there. I'm like, oh, I'll just move it. And the props team was like, don't touch it. I'll handle it. Like freaking out. Yeah. I don't care. You can move my lights anytime. <laughs> I'm, heavy. I'm the same way. I'm the same you way. want to pick There's, up some bags? I bet Jason won't stop you. I won't stop anyone. Anyway. When uh, I, I just did a, a web series a little bit ago, and I was the, the DP, and it was no, you know, low budget, no budget. So they had gotten us several PAs to be on my crew. And at the last minute, I actually asked a friend of mine who was much more experienced if he wanted to come help, and he did. And it was really glaringly obvious that – you know, when you're doing an indie film, you can get the bodies to move stuff around, but knowing what to move and to anticipate was key. My friend was blowing everybody else away because he he knew what I was going to do. He knew where the key light was going to be. He knew what needed to be flagged and stuff. I mean, he was both gaffer sort of and key grip, but that, that experience is important, even if it's just one person on an indie crew. So that they can I've had together. DPs, when I, like if we're doing like a little sort of like, EPK band thing and it's going to be me a DP I'll be like do you want me to get you some kind of PA some kind of body to move stuff and sometimes they're like no it's just faster for me to do it <laughs> than to get like somebody who doesn't know what they're doing Correct. Yeah. sometimes it's a safety thing you know they, they don't know how a stand should be set so then it's it's not you know in the safe situation where it can, it can fall because it's not you know, big leg forward to the weight in the sandbag and so you just don't want anyone to get hurt yeah um, okay, I'm going to remind audience and everybody who's new, uh, put your questions in the comment box. We're going to get to them as we go. As you pick, you put them up, we're going to get them asked. Uh, I would like to, Jason, just really quick, because I know there are people who are going from, like they're in sort of the genie department or working their way up. Yeah. You've gone from key grip to uh, DP. Is that, did I understand that correctly right. on Bosch? Yep. Uh, can you tell us about how that happened? Uh, sure. I mean, originally, you know, when you, you want to get in the movie business, that's, you know, you say, Oh, this is what I want to do. And I always thought I wanted to be DP, but then I realized I didn't know what I was doing. So then I figured I should go to school, which is becoming a grip. And I went to school for the last 20 years and and worked with so many great DPs and just knowing how everything can be, you know, there's a hundred ways you can do a thing. So after that, you know, doing it for 20 years, I decided that, you know, I want to move up to the next level. Normally, the key grip doesn't go to DP. Usually right. the progression is either a, you either a, an operator or a gaffer. But it does happen. There's a few key grips that have moved up. And it is harder. Um, there's some sort of, the, you know, well, how's the key grip going to? He doesn't know. He doesn't know the light. But, it ha- you know, once you've, you've been doing the same thing for 20 years, it turns out you can, you know, if you're paying attention, you know what a light. So in between shows, I would go shoot little short films and whatever I could do. And I said, wow, I really like this. And, you know, and then, but then you have to realize that you, you got to pay the bills. So you got to go back to gripping in between, which is good. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'll ever retire from gripping. I like doing it, but I do want to move to the next level. So, you know, just working hard, paying attention. Sometimes you see these grips, they're just sitting, sitting at the video village on their phones and not seeing how we're doing things. I pay every day I go to set, even today, I, I watch the monitor, see what, what, how is this causing this? And, that's the biggest thing is paying attention. Get off your phone, watch what they're doing, and uh, you know, 
you're at school. It's you're getting paid. Well, this, yeah, exactly. You're getting paid to go to school. As I, I'm yeah. that of that family too. And other than yeah. connections and all that stuff that people get from school, I'm like, yeah. go just work on set. Like, don't that was my, get money. So after home. junior college, I was going to go to USC film school, and someone said, just go work on set and see if you like it first. Because, you know, you, you, there was going to be great connections, I'm sure, through USC, and it changed my path. Going on yeah, set. I, I got, it, it was just so many other, you know, I got to see so many different variations of how things were made. So, and, and me, I did, go, I, I did go to USC, Jason, and I learned more yeah. in the three months I was a camera assistant in my senior year on commercials than I did at USC. So you did the right thing. No crapping on film students. You can no, get no. stuff. And, and if you are a film student, I can't encourage you enough to be using that time to yeah. use the gear that you're getting for free. Like get out yes. there and shoot, 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 and use the time you're in school to get internships at places you cannot get internships once you're out of school. You know, go to studios, go to sets, uh, do these things. That's what school you can get out of school more than like yeah. learning the stuff you're learning. Um, and one more thing on your thing, Jason. So what was the actual thing that happened for you to DP? Did you ask for it? Were you vocal about wanting to do that? On the, on the particular show that I was working on, uh, I, the, the, a DP left kind of last minute and for them to hire a new P, DP who doesn't know, uh, you know, a specific look of the show and, and, the, and that show does so many moves and setups and you have to be fast and, you know, we don't, we don't add hours, we don't add days. So they were like, all right, Jason, you've been doing this, you know what we do. So I asked, I said, I'd love the opportunity to do this. And so they gave it to me. I love that. Cause that's, there's a couple of points may, being made in there. It's, which is, one, you were paying attention the whole time. You were preparing. So when the yeah. opportunity hit, you were ready to go. I love yeah. that. Um, Steve, talk to us a little bit more about like what's like you're working on a reservation dogs. I am. What are what are some of the challenges with working on because I'm thinking a lot of that's like on location as well, right? Yeah, almost all of it. I I hear that this season they're gonna build one set, but last year it was all on location. Uh, we had 10 hour days, didn't break for lunch. Um, and it was awesome. It's the way film should be made really, uh, shorter days. And, and they would just tell the directors, this is the days you have, you need to get it done. And we did, we didn't do any reshoots. We didn't, uh, we had a couple of weather delays where we went a little bit longer than 10 hours because Oklahoma in the spring, we had thunderstorms, but, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a lot different than doing something like uh, Moulin Rouge or something like that. You know, I mean, like Jason, we move two or three times a day on a TV show and, uh, you know, it becomes as much about packing the truck and making your day as it does about anything else. Yeah. Uh, but it's, a you know, Reservation Dogs, fun show and looks good. And so, you know, I said I'd come back for season two. What is, as far as like the, the g and &E department, and either of you can answer this, what is the hardest thing to shoot? Locations, nights, studio, like of everything you've ever done, what really has like been the hardest? The hardest thing I've ever done is being on a glacier when 20 below that zero. Sound fun. Um, oh, I'm going to write that out of that script I was writing. Yeah, yeah. No glaciers. No glaciers. I mean, I did a movie called the edge which was before the revenant same movie as the revenant as far as hardness uh we shot i mean i had one week in canada where it never got warmer than 20 degrees below zero and i guarantee you can't stay warm i'd go into the canadian equivalent of rei every week and go on I'm, I'm still cold and i have money <laughs> fix me you know i hold my arms out give me new jackets, <laughs> gloves give me something because it was it was brutal. So That's I I have no. That was in 1996. I've done my best to avoid cold weather shows since then. I always say that I'm like I don't want any. I want nothing in the snow and I want nothing in the desert. Like I just don't. I've, and I've I'm in LA, so if it's 67, I'm freezing. I can't even imagine that glacier shoot. Oh, no way. And I, at the time I lived in LA, it it, it about killed me. Oh. Was, I, I look back. I bet Jason does the same thing and go. I'm not sure I could do some of the movies now that I did uh, back then. Yeah, I imagine. Jason, what's one of the, what's one of the hardest things that you've had to deal with? Weather is obviously for 
because everyone goes to the grips for like when there's weather issues, we need, you know, it's starting to rain. The grips has to put up a, you know, we're covering and then it's windy and you have to tell the director or the DP that I'm sorry, it's too windy. We can't put this up. And that's where it's hard where you have to say no, because it's a safety issue and as a grip. That's our, you know, another huge thing we do is safety. So wind is our, uh, the grip's worse than that nightmare. Yep. <laughs> trying to, yeah, when you're trying to lighten the wind and, I feel can't. like that's also sounds worse nightmare. Well, yeah. one of them. Oh, yeah. um, I, Kate Fogarty has a great question. It is what is one thing that directors do or don't do that you like or hate, especially when it comes to TV? Cause you guys get different directors coming in all the time. So when you have a director come in, what is it like? Oh, thank God they're this way. Or, Oh my God, they're this way. <laughs> well, I've been yelled at by Michael Mann and Michael Bay Oh my God. You don't uh, work with Michael. Yelled at by a lot of people. Those three happen to be the Michaels that have yelled at me. We could pick another name. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think the one thing that I don't like and won't put up with anymore is getting yelled at. It's just like, no, stop. I mean, I've been yelled at. I mean, yelled at. And I'm not exaggerating. Screamed at. And <sighs> it's like, I don't need that. Nobody yeah. needs so when I teach now, I teach kids. I say, you know, rule number one of, of being a good director, a good DP, whatever, don't be a dick. Don't don't, don't annoy people. It seems like such a simple rule. It does. But yet. Oh, yeah. I mean, you haven't lived until Michael Mann in front of the whole crew said, when I hired you, they told me you were good. Oh, come on. See, I get, I get as a director, I get there's, there's such pressure on your shoulders. Like you're not, you're, you've got all the departments, the entire movie budget, the, the money, the investors made, all of it's on your shoulders and there can be tension, but to say just, but to yell sort of derogatory negative things is so unacceptable. It's oh, one thing, like, I mean, I've had my times where I'm like, what the hell, what is taking so long? Okay. But like that, I just, I don't know. Like well, even I've been working on my patience as well. Cause it's. Well, you know, I just say to them, I say, hey, guys, you think I did this on purpose? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I mean, no, I know what I'm doing. Something happened. You know, the condor didn't work or it's windy, as Jason right. said. I mean, Jason and I take a lot of grief for things that are out of our control just because yeah. people don't understand why you can't put up a condor when it's 30 mile an hour wind. Yeah. We can't shoot without it. Well, OK, I didn't make it. I didn't make the wind. <laughs> You know, I didn't make the rules. It's just how it works. Um, do you have you, any? Yeah. yeah. I, my fit in television, because you, like you said, you get so many directors. I like it when someone comes in and they have, you know, their full shot list. They know that's just, you know, they've done their homework. That's their number one thing. You, you get a week of prep. Then some of these directors don't do, do their homework and they show up and, and they're winging it on the day. And you're just like, you know you're not going to make the day, or it's it's going to be difficult because they're not they're not prepared. So, you know, having your homework done is the number one thing for Can me. Can I ask you guys something on that same note? Because as a director, one of, I've directed six feature films and a bazillion other projects, but I'm still haven't broken into TV. And one of my things, my sort of like internal like fears, is having the crew, you know, the crew mutiny. You hear these whole these stories, like you hate their directors or they make it harder for them. What is the thing that a director who's stepping onto a TV set for the first time with a crew they haven't worked with can do? Uh, having the shot list is great. Are there other things they can do to really kind of win the crew over right away? Be nice. Be nice. Be friendly, be approachable. Uh, you know, I mean, I've had directors come in and say, uh, I, I did, a, I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, he took over for a director that, that got sick. The first thing he said to the whole crew was, I'm used to working with a good crew. I don't know any of you. I can't imagine you're any good. What the? What? I know. Well, actually, ah! I, I think it was Orvinsky. Orvinsky. I don't really? know. Oh. Come wow. After me. wow. Uh, he said that to the whole crew. And I was like, well, great, man. <laughs> Would love you too. What the? I, I, I just. What, I don't know. It drives me nuts too as a director. I hear these stories. So I'm like, there's so many. I know so many directors who are just amazing humans. I'm like, why are garbage humans still getting work? Yeah. Let the good humans get it. I mean, Jason and I both worked with directors that do good work and are fun to work with. There's yeah. absolutely nothing in the canon of filmmaking that says you have to be an asshole yeah. to, to do this. And it's frustrating when they are because it just makes a hard job 
that much harder. So I'm going to have to ask you because he's an idol of mine. So working with Baz Luhrmann, tell me he was the bestest ever. Don't yeah, break my great. heart. Okay. Baz great, very collaborative. Uh, you, I like to say you can't be too weird for Baz. I mean, <laughs> basically, I we made Moulin Rouge up as we went. You know, I mean, we had a script, but we made the look of it up as we went. I, I That blows my mind because it's one of the most amazing, uh, unique films I've ever seen. To think that you just were like, hmm, this would look good. Why don't we try this? No, I mean, that when you say we made it up on the spot, sometimes I had to have a week or so notice because I would order 300 rolls of a certain color. This is before LEDs. It would have been a lot easier now. Yeah. But for the end sequence, we lit that with, a uh, gel called Lee 165. And I had every roll that we could find in the world. I was getting two rolls from Norway, a roll from uh, some little rental house in Florida, things like that. Um, but we made it up as we went. And that's why when I do other movies and they give me a lookbook or a Bible or whatever, I just go, okay, <laughs> whatever. It's still going to get made up on the day. You, you try for this stuff, but it just doesn't happen the way you think it's going yeah. to be. And TV shows are a little more controllable because they don't seem to go over like a movie does. I mean, Moulin Rouge is a 90 day movie that went 180 days. You said you were on it for 14 months. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's so funny. Cause like, I think about the longest I've ever gotten to do a feature, I think was 20 days. I've done one in five days. Cause Ooh. indie producers are insane. I'm just like, oh, the magic I can make with like a month. <laughs> so eight, 14 months. Holy yeah. crap. I mean, that wasn't all first unit, but yes. I, I was on it from July of 99 until October of 2000. Wow. Uh, we got run out of Sydney because the Olympics came. And every day I was having to change hotel rooms because somebody had booked my room. And then I had to give up my car. And then they just said, you know, we're leaving. We went to Spain. We packed up all our sets and went to Spain. Jeez. Yeah. Was that a moment where you were like, well, hey, I have a job. I have to have a job. Or you're like, oh, my gosh, this needs to end. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, everybody wanted off <laughs> that movie. Not not because we were tired of it, but just, I mean, yeah. it was a bad movie. It's just long. Yeah. It's really hard to go to work. I mean, Jay, what, what's Bosch? Eight episodes a season? Jay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So how many days is that? Eight days an episode, so it's not very much. Six, four, <laughs> four months, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Res Dogs is four days an episode, so 32 shooting days. So movies are a little slower. <laughs> a lot slower. I'd say. But fun. What, what were some of the biggest challenges on something like Spider-Man, Jason, that you um, – because there's a lot of visual effects in that. and Well, I mean, it was the first Spider-Man, so it probably wasn't even as visual effects heavy it as wasn't. it is it now. Was, we literally just had green screen and blue screen. Yeah. And that was not a challenge, but I I did have we did uh, X Men in a tiny little island off of uh, Georgia called Jekyll Island, and, and the challenges it was supposed to be a sixteen day reshoot. They came from Europe, and the weather turned, and they they planted all these palm trees on the beach, and they they were dying, so they started spraying them green, and the green started leaking all over the sand. It was eighteen degrees in the morning, and you, it was just, that was one of those things you were like. You know, you don't, you realize that, you know, you, I don't need to be doing these big movies because it's, it's just not worth it. And then, and then they packed everything up after going up 25 days in Atlanta and brought it back to LA and reshot everything. And then you just realize like sometimes the film business is broken because they went there for the incentive. It didn't right. work out. They wasted 25 days of shooting. Nothing was acceptable. And they brought it back to Los Angeles where we, and finished it. And yeah. you, that's when I get a little like, wow, this is like money just thrown away. Yeah. It seems like you both prefer TV because you've both kind of landed there for your longer gigs. Is that accurate? I, mean, I, I kind of like television. I like, the, I like the pace of it. I uh, It keeps me in town. That's another reason. But I also just like the pace. I like to, to know you're you're finishing your story in eight days and and you can see the finished product. And that's, I don't know if that's... You like you know you're moving on <laughs> yeah. one way or another. Yeah, you know you're not going to go by three months yeah. right i mean that's uh romeo and juliet i did that with baz as well <sighs> and uh that was a 45 shoot that went 
holding these gems back. Well, Jen and I no, 45 days that went 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, Peter Pan, a movie I did in Australia, was a 90-day shoot that went between first and second unit 400 days. Jeez. So, you know, and they're all good movies. They're all fun to work on. Do I prefer TV? Uh, no. I'd rather yeah. do a movie. But Res Dogs is such a cool show that I enjoy doing it. It's really fun. But the TV show I did before that, I didn't have Entourage. I didn't have much fun on. So I, <laughs> Can I ask why? It just wasn't fun. It, well, one, I, li I still lived in L.A. And so the, it, they shot everywhere. I lived out in Woodland Hills. So it'd take me forever to get you know, some place to shoot. Like they like to shoot in Hollywood and Santa Monica and it just killed me. The traffic. Yeah. So I gave up, moved to Oklahoma and let them pay me to go to uh, places to shoot. So I was going to ask you about being a local Oklahoman. Is that how we say it? Am I saying mm -hmm. it right? <laughs> do you, do you get any local work there? Oklahoma Are you working? I like. Sure. Well, I mean, Minari, not a lot of people saw it, but it got nominated for Best Picture. That was shot here. Korean movie uh, last year got nominated for six Oscars. I did that. And I did a movie that I shouldn't have done that I'm not going to name because I've taken my name off of it. <laughs> I didn't agree with it politically. And I don't know why I did it. And, uh, you know, I've been trying to do stuff around here. I've been, Res Dogs is in Oklahoma. It's not in Oklahoma City where I live, but it's in Oklahoma. So, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 fun. But four day episodes. I mean, that's half of what Jason's doing. Yeah. Four episode. Of course, we're only thirty minutes. Pretty and much. Is an hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But if I lived in LA, I'd probably do TV. But uh, living in Oklahoma, I just do what comes along, and Res Dogs is the best thing to come. So I know a lot of people, especially since the pandemic are literally they're either have moved or have been considering moving because you kind of start to think i don't have to live in la to do what i want so the fact that you're getting so you are working outside of oklahoma though all right so are you how how are you getting work and getting getting flown places are you saying you'll work local are they they don't care they'll just take you and pay for you oh, they, they care they get pissed off when they find out that i live in oklahoma but they have to employ me out of los angeles that annoys them but it pays better the LA rates are better than the local rates. And in the end, that's why we do this. You know, I mean, I'd love to say that I did it only worked on movies I loved and that were great. And I did it for free, but that's not true. <laughs> you know, you got to make a living. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And of course. I just, you know, I've gotten to the point, like I've been doing this since the original Halloween since before that, but that's the first movie that I did that anybody ever heard of. And so that's 44 years. That's a long time. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I keep asking Steve questions, Jason. I promise I'll get to you. But That's you right. did the original Halloween, and they. I just recently watched the Netflix. Um, how they made how they yeah, made it. Really you know what I'm saying? Saw me. Do what? You saw me in that. I was just saying, oh, were you in that? that? Now I got to go back. That yeah. story was it was insane to to hear how it was basically made like you know an indie movie and became this huge cult classic. Yeah. I, I mean, wow, like to be a part of, you've really been a part of film history. I, I'm in the Back to the Future one too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I have to go back and watch them. That's yeah, great. no, they were fun. They, it was, they did it during the pandemic. I'm the perfect interviewee. They they said, well, do you know any, any camera and sound people? I said, well, yeah. So I lit it. I went to my trailer and got my own lights. They sent a little ring light. I said, well, I'm not going to use that fucking thing. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I got lights and we lit it up and shot it in my house and it was fun. Aww, I, I, like I really no. think uh, both of those episodes, not because I'm in them, but they're just good. They yeah, the, I, I was gonna say that to filmmakers who are watching, if you have not watched the Netflix, what is exactly the title? The, the movies that made us. The movies that made us. Yeah. If you have not watched those, you are missing out. Every single one, for the most part. Some of them are like movies we. Most of us don't even care about. And so, I don't know. I didn't like those as much. But for the most part, every single one is so mind-blowing and the things that you'll learn about behind the scenes. And um, the Halloween one is one of my favorites. So, it's pretty interesting even that. Black the Future was great. I loved the Dirty Dancing one. Like, they're just so good. And I think it's such a great resource for filmmakers. Oh, yeah. They do more. And I, interestingly, they were pretty, pretty accurate. 
you yeah know, memory isn't addled by drugs and everything else at this point we still could remember what we what we did 40 years ago i mean that was what, but i can tell you this in back to the future and halloween no one thought we would be sitting here and the, either one of those movies names would come up this far in the future i get it especially watching those behind the scenes i mean those those netflix episodes yeah. like just blow, mind blowing how they became so huge and now halloween is what on number 82 or something uh, <laughs> like, yes they, they keep trying to kill jason not you but oh no jason's right <laughs> michael michael I, I worked on that too i can't keep <laughs> it from me. Right. um well that's that, a let's a, let's i want to pursue that line a little bit because jason you live in la right i do so you're working out of la i mean did, there's a lot of people who are with the collective that are from other parts of the country and even the world. And yeah. is there, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what keeps you in LA to work. And then Steve, what, you know, how you work the system to get work either way. For me, the number one thing that kept me in LA was uh, when I was doing the, the X-Men uh, in Atlanta and we were supposed to do the 18 day shoot and I had a newborn baby back at home and they said, you have to work till Christmas Eve because that's when the next flight out is. And my wife said, if you're not back by Christmas Eve, and then, so I got back Christmas Eve and she said, you're never leaving town again. And I said, all right. And now it's been 11 years since then. And I have two kids. You know, I eventually, once my kids are older, I think I would, you know, venture out or if there became a good opportunity to shoot something, I would I have to take that. But, you know, I'm lucky enough that we have enough work in Los Angeles. Right now it's super busy. and. Uh, I can stay busy enough here. Jason, have you ever considered the move to Atlanta, like with the whole family, considering you can live on I, there 40 was, acres? And <laughs> I know. I've had lots of friends have done it and they're all, they were gaffers and now they're shooting out there. And um, I just don't know. I don't think it's going to, I like it. I like it here. We have a family, we have, you know, grandparents here and I just. And I sunshine. Just sunshine. Doing when I that that one month in Atlanta, I was like, I, I don't need to come back. It's it's fine. <laughs> As I was on the beach yesterday in California, going, this is pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. for yeah, sure. It's true. It's been warm. Steve, just in contrast to that, you're out of town. Do you feel like your move to Oklahoma was more successful because you'd already established yourself, or do you think that young people in the Griffin Electric departments can actually prosper not living in LA? You know, with that new experience, you know. When I, I've been teaching a lot lately. And one thing I tell them is I've had a pretty good career. I uh, grew up partly on a farm. I had to use an outhouse till I was 10. Oh my God. So, um, and I lived, I grew up in Oklahoma and I went to the university of Oklahoma and I didn't go to film school. I took two film classes, made F's in both of them. Uh, and so I, I, and I ended up here. So, you know, in the film business. So I just want to reassure people that there is no geographical barrier. If somebody like me can come out of a small town in Oklahoma with no film school, anybody can do this if they want it bad enough. That's the key. You got to want to be in the film business to be in the film business. Sure. It just It's a glamorous job, everybody thinks, but it's really a hard job. And it's... You, you have to pay attention, like Jason said. And it breaks my heart when I work with these kids and they're not paying attention. They're just in it for a paycheck and want to go home. I want to go home too, but I want to make a good movie. Yeah. But there is no geographical barrier. I moved back here. I have people come here that won't talk to me because I live here, even though you can look at my IMDb and see that I could probably do Leprechaun 6 or something. <laughs> uh they won't. They say, nah. They've told producers, I won't hire anybody from Oklahoma. Nobody there knows what they're doing. So Aww. I've been teaching, trying to, the class I just finished was a five-week class at Oklahoma City Community College on how to not look stupid on your first day on set. And <laughs> it was from Grip, Grip and Electric. And uh, we, we're going to turn out 16 kids. It'll be good. Better than I was. Oh, I love kid. that. Or better than Jason on his first day, too. Yeah. Remember yeah. that, Jason? I bet you didn't know shit. I certainly didn't. No. <laughs> I don't know how I got through it. Uh, that's in, I, What was your first movie? Oh, God, you've never heard of it. It's called Southern Double Cross. Well, actually, okay. the movie Bare Knuckles was first. 
all the big ones. Halloween was the first one that anybody ever heard of. My mother thought I was dealing drugs, I think, because I was supporting myself in L.A., but no movies would ever come to Oklahoma that I yeah. until Halloween. Jason, what was your first film or project? That people would know of? The one I got my union days on was uh, Your fr your Friends and Neighbors, which was a Neil LaBute. You know, I actually didn't know he was a playwright, and it was like really big actors for me. It was like Ben Stiller was in it. It's a bunch of Jason Patrick and all and all these actors that are huge now. And I, you know, I, you were a young kid, and I, I obviously knew Ben Stiller, but I was like, that was my you know first film where I actually had actors that I knew. It's always cool when you have your first. I remember my second, my third feature I did was with producers that I was said I would never work with again. But when they called me, they're like, "Well, it's got Corey Feldman and Eric Roberts," and I was like, "Oh, I'll have names in a movie, okay?" Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like every time you think you step up, or the, the bigger the names, the more you kind of feel like, okay, I'm I'm doing this. I'm leveling yeah. up. Exactly. I love that. I love that you guys would even, you know, as the g &E department, it's the same sort of feeling. Um, and I love that you guys are, I mean, obviously everybody's doing it for paycheck. You, you got to pay the bills, but I love that you guys do it for more than that. Because um, I do think that it it feels a lot more often that like a lot of people are doing it more for money there's just so much being shot like people who don't know what they're doing are getting into positions and you know everybody's a dp and you find out the hard way that they're not you know yeah. like oh so yeah it's great yeah. to talk to like real craftsmen um, well that's what i feel like i lose a lot of you know i'll go and look for these little jobs and i feel like i'll lose tons of jobs this some afi graduate which is fine i understand because they you know because they've maybe they've shot two creative little things in school but then when you get them in a real life situation, the, someone that's been doing it 20 years will be like, oh, we could do this a lot quicker than this. And it you generally works out in my favor that, oh, that last guy couldn't do that because he didn't have that onset experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. I like, uh, Steve, also what you say about paying attention to what you teach your students. Um, I have an anecdote to share. We started talking about Fred Murphy, one of my first jobs. I think I was still in film school. And I got asked to come in and fill in for a day as a second assistant on an HBO movie that he was shooting. And I knew nothing what was going on. And uh, the, I loaded some nags and brought them out and everybody left, all the assistants left. And I was just standing there. They said, just in case, you know, the director and Fred need something. So I'm just standing there and listening, you know, not too close, but listening. And they're discussing what lens they want. And it just happened to be, they said, okay, yeah, let's, let's go with a 50 on this. And Fred turns around and I'm holding the lens. And that's Aww. simply from paying attention. And I, they wanted me to stay on forever at that point. So I got so many jobs for just being attentive and mm -hmm. not, I mean, we didn't have phones at the time, but not just wandering off and, and uh, being responsible. And that's how my career really prospered the most. So I really it, resonate what you said. What HBO show did you do with Fred? I don't know. I'm going to have to look it up. It's, <laughs> we're talking like 1986, Laguna, eight or seven. Laguna Heat? But, was it Laguna Heat? I, I don't know. I well, can't. Was. I was on that. Oh, maybe. It'd be hilarious if you guys were on that together. I didn't even know. Oh, I was I, that annoying kid that filled in? Well, I, I don't know if Jason feels this way. I used to think I'd remember everybody I worked with on movies when I first started because the crews were small, and I had a better memory, frankly. <laughs> yeah. And now, God, I've done over a hundred movies and thousands of people and I, I run into people and I, I I just did a movie in Ireland right before the pandemic and there was a guy on the we were scouting and the guy on the bus had on an entourage hat and I went hey man did you work on entourage what, what are you doing in Ireland because mm. I was the only American and he said yeah I live here I just lived in LA for a while uh, mm. and I, I neither one of us remembered the other one but we'd both worked together on entourage just the TV show Wow. That's awesome. And it's worse now because everybody's got masks on. You're like, do I know you? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so what, what is your, for both of you, because you're each in different situations, what would be your recommendation for young filmmakers wanting to get into the genie department? You know, maybe their ultimate goal is cinematographer or director or whatever, but they want, they have an affinity like you guys did. And I did actually to, you know the visual side so they want to move up through how would you recommend they get going now while they're in town other jen's point was well taken which is work on stuff but any other particular notes that you could suggest well shoot just shoot 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 
I mean, even if it's stuff that doesn't have any point to anybody but you, because uh, you learn by shooting. And it's you want to have some experience shooting before. I work with a lot of grips and electrics that want to be DPs, and they will go out and shoot stuff on the weekends for free, you know, for friends or for small projects and stuff like that. Uh, and pay attention. What Jason said is absolutely true. You you watch what we're doing, uh, what the DP, the gaffer, the key grip, the director, what everybody's doing. And if, if you do, you can't help but learn, I wouldn't think. Uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Jason, what do you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, go, you know, I go on Craigslist even today to find some DP jobs and, you know, go be a grip on a little student film. Even if you say, oh, I'm a DP, you know, you sit back, watch how that DP does it. You're going to learn something new, probably. Don't don't jump in and say, "Oh, I'm a DP. I, I know what I'm doing." Just you know, go. Ahead. Fortunately, you can't just go work on a union TV set as a grip because there's just not that opportunity. Uh, but more internships are happening. We have we finally have interns, which is something we haven't had since I've got in the business. And oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. we have two so interns this great. season. Yeah, I was going to ask you guys that because um, because it's a union thing and. Uh, and I know you guys started much way longer ago, so it may, it's different. But like, yeah, like how does someone break into TV in a GE field without being in the union? Well, you do there... 90 days and keep your call sheets and paycheck stubs and present yourself to local 80 or local 728 or a studio mechanics local in Atlanta or Austin or someplace else I, uh, for admission. So you, you can work on non-union stuff, but just keep records of that and then present that? 90 days. You can also okay. work 30 days. It's so on union stuff. It's pretty busy. We've had on the last Res Dogs, there was also Killers of the Flower Moon shooting here, the big Martin Scorsese movie. And so it was tough to get guys. So I had a guy on, my, on Res Dogs that got into union. He got his 30 days on Res Dogs because there wasn't anybody available else available and so he got his day so that's how you do it uh and once you're in then it's a matter of contacts because really the film business runs on referrals uh, if somebody calls me for a key grip job I'm, i say why you know how about jason or a dp if they're looking for a dp for something smaller or even something medium size you know i always give them a few names i'll give them jason's name now you know, that, I mean, that's how it works. Yeah. You give people's names that you like and that did a good job. When somebody calls you, you pass it along. And that's how most of it happens. And one of my best friends is a now a union grip, but I, I've known him since he was doing crap money shows. And um, <laughs> but he was such a hard worker and he just started to know everybody. And that's how he got his was yeah. basically someone got him in for a day and the rest was history. As yeah. they say. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I mean, it goes back to don't be a dick. If, if everybody <laughs> likes you, then it's, it's easier to move on. And I don't know if, for me, I found when I was a lamp operator, same thing as a grip, uh, make yourself useful on set so that you stand out from the other six or eight people on set. You know, not not by sucking up, but by like your Lynn's story. You know, they remembered you after that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this yeah. is by paying attention. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think the the key is like because I think sucking up and is a desperate need for attention, whereas working hard and paying attention and, and more like I always tell my new filmmakers, I'm like, always be of service. Always ask, That's how it. can I be of service? Don't ask what is in it for me? Ask, how can I be of service to this person? And then you're going to enjoy yourself more. They're going to recognize you more naturally. And it's not going to feel so needy. Right. Exactly. exactly. Uh, Kate asked, which is, I think is a lot of this we've already kind of answered, but I'm going to put it up in case there's specific, specific things. She says, when hiring Genie Crew, there's specific qualities you look for. I, th I think we've kind of answered in a general way, but if there's like sort of a Thing that you know you always hire this type of person well i always try to hire smart people people smarter than me if nice. you will. uh i've found that's the best way to 
to have a good crew is if everybody's smarter than me, then I can learn from them. And uh, I, I learn something on every job I do pretty much. But I, I like that answer for everybody. Like even as a director, I, I think I should impart that. Um, that should always be everybody I hire needs to be smarter than me. It needs to know more than me. It needs to be yeah. more advanced than me. That's because okay. I feel like I haven't leveled up because of that. And I feel like that makes sense. I love that answer. Well, I've got a dimmer board operator. Kevin Matz lives in Pittsburgh. Um, he starts explaining stuff about the dimmer board to me. My eyes glaze over and I just. <laughs> 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 That's why I hired you. Yes. You know that. You know this. I mean, like Jason, his he may have a dolly grip that wants to explain to him how the hydraulics work in a Chapman dolly. He's like, I don't care. Just, don't care. just so it works. Uh, yeah. You know, that's that's my theory. I hire good people, smart people, and I want them to be also have a film based knowledge. Like I, I, I don't like having crew members that don't go to movies. I don't like having crew members that don't read. Uh, cause I got to spend 12 hours a day with them five days a week. I, you know, it's longer than I spend at home. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Got to have the so, thing, got things to talk about. I, that makes so much sense. Yeah. And if they're smarter than me and interesting, they've got a job with me forever, basically until they move up. That's the other thing is I encourage everybody that works for me to be better than me. If they're, an electrician to be a best boy or to be a gaffer or there's a lot of gaffers and key grips that get uh freaked out that they're training their replacements i'm very happy to train my replacements there's plenty of work for everybody yeah i love that i love that you said that that's great um we're about to wrap up are there any i mean i feel like those were great parting words but if there's any um final thoughts you guys have for new filmmakers in general um or even people who work with you, directors who are hiring g and &E for indie films, like any parting words that come to mind? Mm, for me, I was like, I would say don't give up. There was this time I was, you know, you're doing these $50, $100 a day jobs early on and you were sc barely scraping the money to pay the rent. And then the next one came, but you know, you just got to keep working. On it. I had a roommate, he was a grip and he just couldn't, he couldn't handle the downtime where you were always on the grind and looking for the next job. And I, you know, I stuck at it. I kept doing it. I'm doing it. You know, you slowly move up and if you're passionate about it, just keep, don't give up. Keep, keep trying, keep doing I, what you like to do. I believe everybody will, if you're interested in the film business, everybody will get one break and sometimes more, but everybody that's persistent will at least get that one job where if they, are smart and they do the job well will lead to other things. I mean, Jason and I both have that. John was talking about the lens and Fred Murphy. I mean, this is, this is, you get that break. You don't want to blow it because you may not get another one. And uh, that's, that's what I tell kids. Uh, I say kids, I had some 50 year olds in my class, but it's hard for me to, you know, I've been doing this so long. I've seen it. When I started, they didn't have walkie talkies or cell phones or call sheets were printed on a mimeograph machine. Oh my God. Uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, I'm with you, Steve. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I tell kids, uh, Jason, you're, when did you start? 95. Okay. See, he's not old enough to remember this. We didn't have carts. And Jason's going to look at me and go, what? But when I started, we didn't have carts. That's why both of my shoulders have been rebuilt, because we used to have to carry all the sandbags, all the cable. Everything came from the truck to the set oh. on your back. And people make jokes. Well, what? Are you sold? They didn't invent the wheel yet. But uh, <laughs> no, we just we didn't have carts. So I just picture the one day, the first time someone just decides, oh, I'm going to put things on a cart, walking by people going, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> yeah. No, you can steal grocery carts and, and stuff, and there'd be a, they'd be on the truck, just something to help us carry stuff around. Uh, yeah. We just so, carried it. Man. So uh everybody who's watching is giving thanks right now. Jaka's actor director. She says this was great, super informative. Manchester, thanks for great information. Um, and really thank you guys so much. I didn't really know what to expect from this. And I feel like it's been super inspiring. So thank you for thank your you. time and for joining us. Sure. Thanks. I always yeah. love uh, as many people that I can help get into the film business and have a good life and make good movies. I'm all over that. 
I love that. Thank you, guys. Thanks, uh, guys. Kate says, uh, this was so great. Thank you for all your wisdom and generosity. Uh, great. Er thank you guys so much. Everybody who's here, let me give you a quick little uh, rundown while you wait for the winner of the Da Vinci Resolve seat. Uh, make sure if you haven't mentioned your name yet, let us know you're here right now to get into that, um, that uh, you know, what's it called? Raffle drawing? The Wheel of Randomness. Uh, while you wait for that, our next event is March 10th. It is self-taping for actors and for the filmmakers who help them. So basically, if you're an actor, we're going to have you uh, make sure you know, you know how your self-tape situation is set up. But also, it's a great thing for filmmakers because, one, um, you can actually make a living helping actors self-tape. And two, you know, it's all about lighting and cameras and stuff. So that's good for you, too. Uh, keep an eye out for our March newsletter. It will have all the March events, plus any new initiatives or any new things going on, including our new chapters that are launching all around. Um, last day is today to submit to the accountability initiative. So if you've been looking for a way to level up in your career and have some support system around you, this next year could be your year, but you got to submit your application by today. It's tinyurl.com forward slash BMC accountability. Uh, remember to submit your five minute or less short film. It is free to submit to the Black Magic Collective Film Festival. And there's a lot of really big prizes at the end. And I think this year we're actually going to be able to be in person again. Fingers crossed. Because, you know, if COVID doesn't decide to do some new crazy thing that keeps us inside. Uh, like and follow us on all of our socials. We have a private Facebook group. That group is meant for you to continue this conversation with each other. Ask for advice. Hi, uh, po post jobs you have for crew. Uh, on every once in a while, we have a promote yourself week or day or whatever. So uh, be part of that group. And uh, finally, again, thank you to our sponsors, Black Magic Design and Sigma, for keeping us alive this year. Thank you guys for all sticking around and being so, um, you know, in the, what's the word, communicative, supportive, fun in the chat. And, and our winner is Tim Lorge is the winner of the Da Vinci Resolve seat. Tim, we will be in touch with you. And until our next event in March, I'll see you then.